Hello students, Sean McMahon here. Hey, in this video, we're gonna talk about the periodic table. And the first thing I wanna let you know, you don't have to memorize this. When students think that they have to memorize a periodic table, of course that's gonna scare them. It's scary, but you don't have to memorize it. All you have to do is be comfortable and knowing how to use it. And that's what this video shows. It shows you how to use it. And once you use it as a reference, you find it to be the best cheat sheet in the world. You can have this for all your quizzes and tests and just reference it and it's gonna help you understand chemistry, how it's organized, the elements are organized, and it's all pretty much based on, you'll see the number of electrons and how they stack in their energy levels. So let's start with the basics. So Mendeleev was the first to organize elements based on properties. And it's referred to as a law because he was able to predict what future events would occur based on his observations. So a lot of times you hear periodic law based on what's expected to happen. So here was the periodic law. He took all the elements that he was studying and he just put them in a kind of a straight line and saw that some of the elements had really similar properties and their physical and chemical properties kind of matched up. So what this shows you is the ones that are color coded are, have very similar properties. So what he did instead was instead of doing one long row, he started to stack the properties of elements in what are referred to as columns or we'll call them as groups. So it took on this new shape, right? So here's a little mini, you know, periodic table. Uh, it's omitting the transition metals. That's that huge D block, that huge uh, middle section of the periodic table. But this is basically what it would look like. And he left blank spaces for any elements that hadn't been discovered, but he thought should exist in the future. So this little mini periodic table is basically the representative elements, and that's kind of the focus of our video here. So again, when we look at this, man, it looks scary. But one of the things I want you to notice is you got this little staircase all along here on the periodic table, okay? And the way I want you to look at it is everything to the left of that staircase is a metal, with the exception, of course, of hydrogen. And we'll talk about why hydrogen's on that side in the next videos. But for the most part, everything to that side of the staircase is a metal. Anything to that side of the staircase is a non-metal. And that in itself is really powerful. Just being able to look at the periodic table and figure out which elements are metals and non-metals that's going to help you tremendously in this course. So let's go a little bit further in the three types of elements. So we have that zigzag. And you can see along that zigzag, you have elements like boron, silicon, germanium, arsenic, antimony, tellurium, poloninium, and yep, astatine. Oops. So all of those that are hugging along that line, those are actually considered metalloids. They're not really metals or non-metals, but what they do is they separate the non-metals from the metals. So metals, again, they're located to the left of the zigzag. The non-metals are to the right. And we see that the metalloids are hugging along this particular zigzag. So typically the way the zigzag works, it starts at boron and you just go down each stair. So I'm just going down the stairs. You can also notice that it has a pattern that you have a shading of one, then you shade two elements, two elements, two, and lastly one. So if you could remember one, two, 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 one, all along the staircase starting at boron, going one step at a time, you'll remember which elements are metalloids. So we've, we've talked a little bit about physical properties 
of elements and how we can use that to help us identify the different elements. For example, boiling point, melting point, density, those are all important physical properties. But now we're gonna talk about specifically characteristics of you know, metals, non-metals, and metalloids. So when you think of a metal, they're shiny, right? And they're ductile. That means you can hammer them into a certain shape, okay? And draw them out into long strings, okay? Actually malleables, uh, where you can hammer them into shapes like swords and things like that. Ductile is you can draw them out into long strings. But these are some characteristics that made them uh, so coveted as forms of jewelry or currency, right? They're really good conductors of heat and electricity. That's why we use them in wiring. That's why we use them for pans, pots and pans. Now, most of the time, metals are found as solids. There is an exception. If you look in the transition metals, mercury is found as a liquid. Some periodic tables actually color code it, and it'll be color coded for a liquid along with bromine. But for the most part, your metals are solids. Non-metals, they're not shiny, they're not malleable, they're not ductile, so you can't really hammer them. They're dull, right? If you try to hammer them out, they're brittle, and they're poor conductors of heat and electricity. So basically everything a metal is, a non-metal is the opposite. And they're good insulators. The other thing that I wanna mention is metals have really high melting points and boiling points. That's why they're solid at room temperature. Non-metals have lower melting points and boiling points. That's why a majority of them are found as gases. Now, not all non-metals are gases. An example, carbon can be found as either graphite or the allotrope diamond. So carbon can be found as a solid. You have your phosphorus, that's a solid. And your sulfur is found as a solid, right? So there, there are some non-metals that are solids. Iodine, you also have uh, bromine, which is another liquid. The reason why I'm writing two here is those are examples of what are called diatomic elements or molecular elements where you have more than one combined in nature. Same with the phosphorus and the sulfur. Another example of that would be your selenium. Okay, so metalloids, well, think about metalloids. Silicon was one of the metalloids. And metalloids are in the middle of a metal and a non-metal. So they're not good conductors, but when you think of silicon, which is a metalloid, Silicon Valley, right? They're semiconductors. So they're better conductors than non-metal, but not as good as metals, All right? So we call them semiconductors. They're also semi-insulators. The other thing is, not only does the periodic table separate the metals from the non-metals, it also provides information as far as columns and rows. So typically when we refer to a column, we call it a group. So as I go down, that is a group. Sometimes it's referred to as a family because elements in the same group, the same family have similar physical and chemical properties. When I go across a row on the periodic table, that's referred to as a period. You might even hear sometimes it being referred to as a energy level or an energy shell. Those are references based on the distance of electrons from the nucleus of the atom. And we had talked before that based on this distance or these positions of electrons, it gives these uh, electrons different potential energy, or we can think of it as chemical energy. So when you look at a periodic table, you can get quite a bit of information just looking at your groups and periods, right? So if you go down in group two, 
you see that this is a family, right? If you go across this row, this is a period, okay? And what this allows you to do is you can easily identify elements by saying, for example, what is the element in period four group two? And you would easily identify that as that's the element calcium. So that is one of the advantages of being comfortable with identifying things as periods and groups. Now, the old school method, we use 2A, and I'll talk about that in a moment, but it's either 2 or 2A for now. So if you look at the periodic table, the way it goes is as you go from left to right, you see that the numbers increase. One, two, three, it goes all the way over here to 12, then 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. The old school method uses, it takes out this center piece right here that has 10 uh, groups or 10 uh, columns. And those 10 columns are your transition elements. If I subtract 10 from 13, I get 3A. If I subtract 10 from 14, I get 4A. So the old school method uses the uh, number and the letter, and it's easier because in the future, when we talk about Lewis dot symbols, what's really happening is it's representing the number of valence electrons. So the 3A is three valence electrons and valence electrons being the electrons in the outer shell. So either number is okay if you remember. You can use, for example, for the noble gases, 18 or 8A. Old school method is focused on the valence electrons, which I think is very useful. So group numbers, one through 18, used to identify left to right. We can use the letter A to represent the elements 1A to 8A, and the letter B for those 10 columns, right, in the center that I call the transition metals. So several groups of representative elements are known by what are referred to as family names. So your families, group one or group 1A, and these are metals, right because they're left of the staircase and so remember the staircase here i have my staircase right so they're left of that staircase we see that the alkali metals are group one and alkaline earth metals are group two if we come all over to the side we see that group 8A or 18 are the noble gases. We'll also talk about how all elements want to be a noble gas. That's why they have that name. They're noble. Everybody wants to be noble. We'll see that they're highly stable elements because they have what's referred to as an octet in their outer shell of electrons or their valence shell. The group right next to the noble gases are extremely reactive nonmetals, and those are called halogens. So, again, periodic table, it's basically focused on three types of elements. To the left are my metals of the staircase, to the right are my nonmetals, and then I have columns, which are groups and rows, which are periods. So up and down is a group, rows are periods. So I hope that helps. In the next couple of videos, we'll talk about some other things you'll notice on the periodic table on top of where they're located and on top of their symbol and what those numbers represent. Thanks so much for tuning in.